Grace Paley. She was a joyous inspiration to me and somebody that also made me believe you can lead a full life with family and friends and writing. Grace Paley would have been very uncomfortable if anyone had called her a genius, but she was one. Donald Bartholomew called her a combative pacifist and a cooperative anarchist. And she felt that really characterized her. Grace maybe changed literature by paying attention to the beautiful language of ordinary people. Grace Paley, in her feminism, also had a very loving portrait of men. She loved little children. She regarded them as part of the population. Grace would, as the Quakers say, speak truth to power. Grace taught me to place literature at the center of life and not to the side, separate from politics, separate from the kitchen, the bedroom, all the really interesting places where life happens. Grace gave herself to protest. Things were not too small and they were not too big. I don't think I've ever met anybody or known anybody in my life that was so inspiring and accessible at the same time. Grace Paley's writing and politics is a certain form of love for the world, for others. Grace wrote about all the people in the city, all the intertwinings, all the bustle, all the different stories, and all the noise. Grace Paley, both in her fiction and her poetry, there's nobody like her. This is a rather cheerful one. Is that the cops or what? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I really wrote this for my grandson. The poet's occasional alternative. I was going to write a poem. I made a pie instead. It took about the same amount of time, of course. <laughs> of course, the pie was a final draft. <laughs> a poem would have had some distance to go, days and weeks, and much crumpled paper. The pie already had a talking, tumbling audience among small trucks and the fire engine on the kitchen floor. Everybody will like this pie. It will have apples and cranberries and dried apricots in it. Many friends will say, why in the world did you make only one? This does not happen with poems. <laughs> because of unreportable sadnesses, I decided to settle this morning for a responsive eatership. I do, I do not want to wait a week, a year, a whole generation for the right consumer to come along. <laughs> Grace Paley brought a language into literature that, as far as I know, I hadn't ever seen before anyway or heard before, but it was her speaking voice, really. 
And it was her memories of her family and the street where she grew up. And she brought that speech into literature forever. There's nobody like her. That's something that I can't say enough. My parents came from Russia. Uh, they came in around 1905 uh, after my uncle was killed. My father had been in Siberia. He'd been imprisoned in Archangel. And my mother yes. had been sent into exile. So, I mean, they were socialists and very active, I guess. The Tsar had a son, and everybody under 21 was freed. Anyway, that's how my parents got out. The, they were under 21, and they were, these guys, they were all free. And my grandmother would describe her five children at supper. And uh, one was a socialist, one was a communist, one was a Zionist, one was an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I forgot what the other one was. But she used to describe meal times as sheer hell. Because <laughs> 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 sure they all fought each other. <laughs> so anyways, we came to this country. They're like 21 years old. They immediately had two kids, not me. And, um, and I'm born about 15 years later when they're quite comfortable in the world and have been to school and got their professions and how, how they did all that in those few years, I don't know, but they did. The man sat beside my aunt on the Brighton Beach boardwalk bench. He looked at her. He fell in love with her immediately. This was because of her beauty and shy, middle-aged friendliness. He had been a widower for years. They had tea in a shop under the Brighton Beach L three or four times. Then we said, we would like to meet him. Well, we all agreed, a kind and thoughtful man, thank God. Come for supper next week. Then he invited her to meet his family, his daughters and his sons, two of each. Unfortunately, he was rich. They often thought of that fact. They said he was not, she was not their kind. My aunt and the man had tea once more. He said, what can I do? They're my children. That was his goodness and loyalty. Years earlier, in another country, Russia, when she was about 16, she had expected happiness. It was a boy, 18, as boys often are. This expectation coincided with the decision of many Russians to kill many Jews. These decisions were called pogroms. To save themselves, her mother and brother and sisters sailed to the great city, New York. In this way, my aunt missed the First World War, the Russian Revolution, more pogroms, the Second World War, the Holocaust, as well as the consummation of that always remembered love, which she had thought would be her life. For the next 50 years, she lived in our family house. Her mother, my own grandmother, was there my brother and sister too, and me, a child who loved her. She often thought that my father, her funny, smart, big brother, could be her life if he only tried. But he was already the life of too many people. First of all, I was very entranced by my, by my father and my mother's, um, by their histories. Uh, I considered them very heroic and uh, and was full of admiration for them. My sister and brother really were, you know, off in their own lives already, and, and really were, on, on my, uh, until very recently, my brother was quite conservative, and since he's 93 now, <laughs> he's only been kind of centrist for about two years. <laughs> <laughs> so, apparently, the year I was born, my uncle, the one who was an anarchist, was uh, deported. There was a tragedy for my grandmother and my aunt, but nobody really talked about it very much until my father one day told me how this uncle of mine, this boy, they were in their early 20s, had come to the photography store where my father was working, and, and he said, held him up, he said, Zinia, I want your money, and my father said to him, Patricia, why, why do you come to the store like this with a gun and everything to ask me for money when if you were home, you could ask me for money? I'd give you money. <laughs> he said, because I don't want your money. I want your boss's money. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, <laughs> so my father had to give him some money. I don't judge other people for their ways that they choose to defend themselves. I, I think it's our job, uh, my job, 
uh, you know, to, um, to bring as much nonviolence to my government as I can. I, I can't be uh, the boss of the whole world. Um, and I, I just feel bad enough that most of us pay taxes uh, for all of these guns and, and stuff like that. I met Grace at Sarah Lawrence College in uh, 1966. And it was just after she had been let out of jail when she was trying to stop a tank. It was a kind of military uh, dis display. It was one of, a, one of those days in which nations, including this one, celebrates victories and military things. She sat down with a flower in the middle of the road. She was, I didn't know her then. She was arrested. She spent uh, a month in the women's house of detention. And for her, I think this was a very important experience. And she began to see women at prison and women, and how women, you know, the, uh, the, the camaraderie among women and the uh, oppression of women. And she wrote a, an article that I read in the Village Voice about that experience, and it was probably the first thing I read of hers, and it was <laughs> quite wonderful and am amazing, and most of all, of course, I admired her courage. What a terrible racket they made, beating all those swords into plowshares. <laughs> People were deafened worldwide. Letters of protest, as well as serious essays, pointing out in the sensible way of ordinary people, we no longer use plowshares. <clears throat> swords have been for generations the playthings of boys and men. Now, the government that year happened to be a poet. It explained in a kindly way, citizens, we had in mind a living, performing metaphor using familiar religious themes and literary memories. Of course, once we get those useless plowshares, there may be a couple of economic or industrial uses. We will even be able to beat them back into swords, should swords still be required by boys and men. <laughs> Grace probably led one of the most well-blended lives. You know how many of us strive to have a life that isn't pulled in where you make a living and where you do your politics and where your friends are and where your family is and where your recreation is. She, almost without striving, but probably she did, probably she did strive to make a life that was very integrated, very much of a piece. You're always in a state of tension. I don't mean interior tensions. Uh -huh. I don't mean spiritual tension. I mean you're, you're in normal tension. That is, you get pulled to do politics, you get pulled to do writing, you get pulled to do keep an eye on the family. You know, which you know now there's a grandchild. I, I hate to be away from her for 20 minutes even. So you're pulled this way, you're pulled that way, and you just you're just pulled. That's all. It's hardship. I think it's that most people think that they're supposed to live in some spectacular kind or some marvelous kind of constant equilibrium, and they they get scared of of that kind of of, of pulling. Well, um, I don't know how you're supposed to live. You know, maybe mm -hmm. some people are supposed to live that way, but as for me, I just uh, I just think that if you can take some of that. You shouldn't be afraid of it because it, your life is interesting. I mean, it makes your life very interesting. Is there any advice that you would you would give to writers who are who are just starting out? Well, I think you have to. The main thing you have to, um, as I said, the first thing you have to do is um, is um, um, keep a low overhead in your life. That's really true. I'm not joking about that. And uh, the next thing you have to do is, uh, with whomever you live, your uh, wife or husband or sweetheart or whatever, um, they should be. They should really. Uh, they should have some regard for your work. You think these things are not important, but they really are terribly important in your life as a writer. I mean, in your life, which is what I'm talking about. And the next thing you have to do is learn how to tell the truth all the time. Those are the main things is to write, is to be truthful, and to be able to look at yourself and see if you're just being trendy or whether you're writing the lines that you're somebody, you know, that you're 
uh, uh, teacher likes you to like, write, you know, which might be good. I'm not against that. I'm teaching myself. I can't speak too bad about it. But, uh, and then you have to really work. You can't, uh, you, know, you really have to just do it. And if, as you do it, you get, you, you'll get either better or worse. If you get worse, you know you better get out of that business. I worked all day on a poem that wasn't going anywhere. I worked all evening, and it began to go somewhere. I hadn't been there before, and that was good for the poem. But for me, it was an anxiety that would last all night. Luckily, nowhere appeared. I rested in it until the window said, look at me, daylight. Then I began again. I was a student of Grace Paley's, whether I was sat in her class or not. Um, she, um, she made me believe in myself. She made me believe that writing mattered in the world and other things mattered in the world too. And she made me believe that po poetry or writing, I guess, was somehow not connected to ego, but to connection with other people. Later on, Grace became my advisor. I was going through a period when I couldn't write poems at all, and I went to see Grace, and I said, I just don't feel I have anything to say. And she said, no, no, you know you have something to say, you just feel you don't have someone to tell it to. Tell it to me. I think it's something that kept me writing probably all my life. What Grace did for me, or what she meant for me as a teacher, as a person in my life, is um, that she pointed out that story that was right in front of me, and for some reason I hadn't, you know, I, I couldn't see it yet, or that was already in my ear. And she got me to pay attention to the world around me, starting with the family members around me and then moving out from there. That's the way she taught. She saw what I was doing a, a, a second before I saw it, or a few seconds before I saw it, and sort of, or saw the best of what I was doing and kept pushing me in that direction. And that direction was outward to pay attention to the world. And she became a voice in my head, and, you know, and that voice is, is still in my head 30 years later. It was really not until I had kids and spent my life in the village and the Vietnam War. Pacifism had simply never entered my mind until around that period. I owe a great deal of it, really, to the Friends. Towards the end of the 50s, the uh, Friend Service Committee began to organize peace centers all over the country, and they happened to organize one um, in, the, in Greenwich Village, where I was living at the time. And I happened to be a very active member of the PTA. It was my favorite organization, by the way. <laughs> the kind of uh, politics we were doing at that time was this business of civil defense drills. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. The flash of an atomic bomb can come at any time, no matter where you may be. Duck and cover fast, wherever you are. It's a bomb. Duck and cover. Duck and cover. This family knows what to do, just as your own family should. You remember all those little ones? Yeah. So these, all these, and they, these were destroyed in the city of New York by Dorothy Day and the yeah. Catholic Board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, just by her standing there year after year, first by herself, and then pretty soon everybody was laughing at the whole goddamn thing. So that was also <laughs> a very big influence on, on my thinking. The thinking that led to armaments and nuclear weapons and, and solutions to everything in terms of war was uh, um, something that left out the sense that, of life that women and mothers and families have. She loved little children. She'd be walking along talking to her, you'd be in the playground, and. You'd think you would you think he was paying attention to what she was saying, but she was paying attention to the children. So that's her whole fight for the playgrounds and the and the parks and uh, and not letting the buses go through uh, the area of the playgrounds and for the school. She was very rooted in the neighborhood, very much as my own mother was. Grace was rooted there at the same time, you know. 
She protested in Red Square in Moscow. She protested the nuclear weapons, just as she protested it on the White House lawn. She went to Vietnam to, um, in connection with the with the American prisoners, but she was very much against the war in Vietnam. But that didn't make her feel that she shouldn't be interested in the in the soldiers. She was found in such a variety of places. And then she wrote, she wrote a lot. This house is a wreck, said the children, when they came home with their children. Your papers are all over the place. The chairs are covered with books, and look, brown leaves are piled on the floor under the wandering Jews. Your face is a wreck, said the children, <laughs> when they came home with their children. There are lines all over your face, your neck's like a curious turtle's. Why did you let yourself go? Where are you going without us? This world is a wreck, said the children, when they came home with their children. There are bombs all over the place. There's no water. The fields are all poisoned. Why did you leave things like this? Where can we go, said the children. What can we say to our children? I became more interested in local action than in anything else. And I was more interested in, in work in the neighborhood, partly because the kids in the school. So we, we were really, Sybil Claiborne and I and a few others were really very involved in, in, in making changes in schools. Almost the exact same changes people are trying to make now. I mean, you can't say we had any success at all, but we learned a lot. So we were smarter after uh, our children got out of school than we were when they just went in. I don't know about them, though. <laughs> By then, she had become quite interested in uh, women and ecology. Perhaps Grace had been thinking about that for a long time. It was a developing idea. So you see, you just see that how her thinking wasn't stuck anywhere. Grace's thinking went in that direction, just the way it had gone with, with the neighborhood and with the playground and uh, how she thought about a lot and she wrote about in essays and in poems how women and families and the city, how we could live in an abundant way. One of the great events that gave me great courage had nothing really to do with Peace and War. It had to do with our park, which is Washington Square Park, a park which many of you know whether you lived there or you didn't live there. <laughs> and it had to do with Robert Moses. What he believed in doing was driving Fifth Avenue through the park yeah. to the other side to create a Fifth Avenue on the other side of the park and then and the rise of, in real estate and stuff like that. That was his determination. So the, the fight of the community to keep that park intact, to prevent the buses from parking in the park and so on, was a great struggle. It, was, um, it lasted several years. Everybody, everybody was involved in it, and we won. And then we won another thing around the park. They said nobody could play any music. And we had a sit-in. But the cops came and really attacked us all. And we, but we won that also. So I'm just, I just mentioned that because you really need victories. Mm -hmm. You've got to yeah. have a few victories. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very painful not to have any. Mm -hmm. And these two little municipal victories in the park, which really I think affected other people in the city so that so to, to sustain their struggles mm -hmm. along the uh, river, along the uh, Hudson River and, and, and so on were, were very important. So that was a very encouraging thing to me. And then when I began to work in the Peace Center um, and uh, my, my politics really turned around in many ways. We didn't believe in uh uh, the end justifies the means. We didn't believe in uh, in uh, meetings that didn't include people that weren't democratic, that weren't uh, um, putting our 
our beliefs into practice right as we were trying to change, change things. This is very hard to do. In San Salvador, come, look, they said, here are the photograph albums. These are our children. We are called the mothers of the disappeared. We are also the mothers of those who were seen once more and then photographed. Sometimes parts of them could not be found. A breast, an eye, an arm is missing. Sometimes a whole stomach. That is why we are called the mothers of the disappeared, although we have these large, heavy photographs, albums full of beautiful, torn faces. Two. Then one woman spoke. About my son, she said, I want to tell you, this is what happened. I heard a cry, mother, mother, keep the door closed, a scream, the high voice of my son. His scream jumped into my belly. His voice boiled there and boiled until hot water ran down my thigh. The following week, I waited by the fire making tortilla. I heard, what? The voice of my second son, mother, quickly, turn your back to the door, turn your back to the window. And one day of the third week, my third son called me. Oh, mother, please hurry up. Hold out your apron. They are stealing my eyes. And then in the fourth week, my fourth son, no, no, it was morning. He stood in the doorway. He was taken right there. Before my eyes, the parts of the body of my son were tormented. Are you listening? Do you understand this story? There was only one child, one boy. Like Mary, I had only one son. We did a vigil for eight years during the Vietnam War, using almost the same leaflet. It was a local place, but it had hundreds of tourists coming through it from all over the world, you know, so there were always new people coming. And what our leaflet did was give all the names of places where young men could figure out how to get out of, out of the draft. And that stayed the same for eight years. I mean, except we added new places. And on the back of the leaflet, we, we had everything that was happening and what we were going to do next and where the next demonstration would be and so forth. But we, we were able to maintain the same, the same vigil there. But we also did a lot of different things. We were kind of the auspices for a certain amount of street theater that actually Bob did mostly and did a lot with Bread and Puppet. You wouldn't have thought of Grace as ambitious, but she was. She was ambitious. Not in a self-aggrandizing way, but she was ambitious for a life of size. And I think uh, that was a certain source of our closeness, thinking of ourselves as two little girls growing up in the Bronx without degrees and... Uh, uh, you know, being helped all along the way. She had a grasp of the importance of feminist insights without being a very ideological feminist. When newspapers or radios and wanted to interview some somebody, Grace made use of her uh, of her fame as a literary person um, to to talk about the nuts and bolts and, and uh, you know, the passions involved in trying to um, end war. I'd go around and do t a lot of talks at colleges, and I'd go under the auspices of being an English literature and, and writer and stuff like that. So I talk to people who don't, you know, who, who come not knowing that they're going to get a political... <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a and, but there are kids that, that um, in the last five years, I'd say, there are more kids thinking about all of this, yeah, and there is more there. action, and it's happening mm -hmm. everywhere. This poem is, um, for all of us, it's called Fathers. Yeah. Fathers are more fathering these days. 
They have accomplished this by being more mothering. <laughs> what luck for them that women's lib happened. Then the dream of new fathering began to shine in the eyes of free women and was irresistible. On the New York subways and the mass transits of other cities, one may see fatherings of many colors with their round babies on their laps. This may also happen in the countryside. <laughs> These scenes were brand new, exciting for an old woman who had watched the old fathers gathering once again in familiar army camps and comfortable war rooms to consider the necessary eradication of the new fathering fathers who are their sons, as well as the women and children who will surely be in the way. Thank you, Grace. We had come to understand uh, the ways in which, uh, say, just the money and resources of the country, which came from women just as it came from men, but how, in a certain way, it was uh, uh, directed to the pursuits of the Pentagon. That was our big thing then. The power of the Pentagon to use up the resources of the world in uh, and certainly in the United States in a way that uh, did not benefit uh, communities, cities, um, poor people certainly, and women in general. never looked really for compliments or for testimonials, but she deserved it and she got it. And I think little by little, this individual little woman with her feistiness and her presence and her humor and her wit and her, all of that, and her deep, wonderful talent became so clear that she became a public figure and became a bestseller in the best sense. We needed those books, women needed those books young people, a book, books which in their embrace really so much of life in New York, of issues of class and race and youth. I gave that kid away like he was an old button. Here, old button, get off of me. I don't need you anymore. Go on, get out of here. Go into the army. Sew yourself on the colonel's shirt or the captain's fly, jackass. Don't you have any sense? Don't you read the papers? Why are you leaving now? That kid walked out of here like he was the cat's pajamas. What are you wearing PJs for, you damn fool? Why are you crying? You couldn't get another job anywhere anyways. Go march to the Army's drummer. Be a man like all your dead uncles. Then think of something else to do. Lost him. Sorry about that, the president said. He was a good boy. Never see one like him again. Why did you repeat that, Your Honor? Why don't you sizzle up the meaning of that sentence for your breakfast? Why don't you stick him in a prayer and count to 10 before my wife gets you? That boy is a puddle in Beirut. The paper says, scraped up for singing in church, too bad, too bad, is a terrible tune. It's no song at all. How come you sing it? I gave away that kid like he was an old button. Here, old button, get off of me. I don't need you anymore. Go on, 
Get out of here. Go into the army. Sew yourself onto the colonel's shirt. Captain's fly, jackass. Don't you have any sense? Don't you read the papers? Why are you leaving now? She's the kind of original that I think Chekhov must have been, you know, who she loved. I mean, and the, Isaac Babel and those people. Those were her people. You know. She had their books and their pictures in her office. And, yeah. But she was that, I think she was that kind of uh, original genius. Yeah. Mm. I thought in terms of poets mostly when I first began writing, of Yeats and, you know, poets like mm -hmm. that and Blake. I, I mean, that's what really interested me was poetry more than anything else. As for fiction, I read everything. I mean, I, you know, one of those kids you'd call a big reader. Mm -hmm. So I really read tons and tons of, 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 of stuff. I think I learned something about storytelling from Joyce, really. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, although although you don't want to use those forms now, you want to do something else. Still, you can learn a, a lot from reading Dubliners to this day, and you certainly can read, learn a lot from Chekhov. I mean, whose forms are much looser than Joyce. You know, you could you just you. In fact, he has such a variety of stories. Chekhov, from the little two pages to thirty-five page stories. I started to write stories because because mainly what I was interested in at that at that first looking moment, which is the moment that carries through a lot of your artistic life, you know, the, the first moment you look, listen, and feel, and that follows you. It was the life of women and children. Somewhere between Greenfield and Holyoke, snow became rain, and a child passed through me as a person moves through mist, as the moon moves through a dense cloud at night, as if I were cloud or mist, a child passed through me. On the highway that lies across miles, of stubble and tobacco barns, our bus speeding, speeding, disordered the slanty rain, and a girl with no name, naked, wearing the last nakedness of childhood, breathed in me, once, no, two breaths, a sigh, she whispered, hey you, begin again, again? I can, I can, you'll see, it's easy, begin again, long ago. Grace the publisher, Grace the writer, Grace the friend, Grace the concerned citizen, the political person, it was all the same Grace. And that sense of humor about politics and that inability of Grace to be judgmental um, or to flatten people and uh, to put people on two sides, you know, um, but to kind of connect them by way of humor um, was, was an important lesson. A couple of people have asked me to read it. Uh, one, one of the uh, stories in, these, in this collection, and uh, it, I'm, I decided to read Enormous Changes uh, at the last minute, That's that particular story. Um, can you still hear me? It's getting dark out there, so I keep thinking they can't hear me. <laughs> Pa, Alexandra said, don't you think a woman in this life ought to have at least one child? No doubt about it, he said. You should have had it only you were married to Granovsky, the communist. We disagreed. He had no sense of humor. He's probably boring the Cubans to death this very minute. But he was an intelligent person. Otherwise, I would have had brilliant grandchildren. They would not necessarily have the same politics. Then he looked at her, her age and possibilities. He softened. You don't look so bad. You could still marry, dear girl. Then he softened further, thinking of hopeless statistics he had just read about the ratio of women to men. Actually, so what? It's not important, Alexandra. According to the Torah, only the man is commanded to multiply. You are not commanded. You have a child you don't have. God doesn't care. 
You don't have one, you call in the maid. You say to your husband, sweetie, get my maid with child. <laughs> okay. Well, your husband has anyway been fooling around with the maid for a couple of years, but now it's a respectable business. Good. <laughs> you don't have to go through the whole thing. Nine months, complications, maybe a cesarean. No, no, no. Pronto. A child for the Lord. Hosanna. Pa, she said several weeks later. What if I did have a baby? Don't be a fool, he said. Then he gave her a terrible, long medical look, which included her entire body. He said, why do you ask this question, huh? He became red in the face, which had never happened. He took hold of his chest with his right hand and the hospital buzzer with the left. First, he said, I want the nurse now. Then he ordered Alexandra, marry. Her father said, explain it to me, please. For what purpose did you act out this nonsense? For love? At your age? Money? Some conniver flattered you? You probably made him supper. Some starving ne'er-do-well probably wanted a few meals and said, why not? This middle-aged fool is an easy mark. She'd give me pot roast at night, bacon and eggs in the morning. No, Pa. No, Alexandra said. Please, you'll get sicker. I want to tell you one more thing, Alexandra, her father said. You are embittering my last days and ruining my life at, at the end. After that, Alexandra hoped every day for her father's death so she could have a child without ruining his interesting life. <laughs> at the very end of it, when ruin is absolutely retroactive. <laughs> Alexandra's father's life was not ruined nor did he have to die. Shortly before the baby's birth, he fell hard on the bathroom tiles, cracked his skull, dipped the wires of his brain into his heart's blood. Short circuit. He lost 20, 30 years in the flood, the faces of nephews, in-laws, the names of two presidents, and the war. His eyes were rounder. He was often awestruck, but he was smart as ever and able to begin again with fewer scruples to notice and appreciate. The baby was born and named Dennis for his father. Of course, his last name is Gronofsky because Alexandra's husband's name, Gronofsky the communist. The lepers who had changed their name to the edible Amanita <laughs> taped the following song in his tiny honor. It was called, Who I? The lyrics are very simple, they are. Who is the father? Who is the father? Who is the father? I, 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 I. <laughs> I am the father. I am the father. I am the father. Dennis himself sang the solo, which was I, 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 I. <laughs> in a hoarse, enraged, prophetic voice. He had been brave to acknowledge the lyrics. This song was sung coast to coast and became as famous from the dark main woods to Texas's Shining Gulf, and it was responsible for a statistical increase in visitors to old age home <laughs> by the apprehensive middle aged and the astonished young. <laughs> When this old body finds that old body, what a nice day it is. When that old body loves this old body, it's dreamless to sleep and busy to wake up. When this old body says, you're a little lumpy here and there, but you're the same old body after all, old body, old body, in which somewhere between crooked toe and forgetful head, the flesh encounters soul and whispers you. All of our political ideas, all of our ideas for changing the world, in, in the end, one of the strongest ingredients is courage. It's 
you, you have a limit in what you can accomplish if you don't have courage. If you don't have the courage to say what you believe in wherever you are and whoever is listening, including your next door neighbors, it, including the people who employ you, um, including the policeman <laughs> standing there or riding a horse. Um, the whole, that speak truth to power was something Grace understood and could do. She was really brave. She was a brave person and with the risks she took and the political acts that she chose to do and with her writing. She didn't write like anybody else. <laughs> she left a great legacy. I'm going to end with this poem. <laughs> Some of you know it. It's called Responsibility. And it really is funny because it, I, I did really say that, that the writer has no special responsibility. I said that, but, you know, now I'm going to say something else. <laughs> <laughs> it is the responsibility of society to let the poet be a poet. It is the responsibility of the poet to be a woman. It is... It is the responsibility of the poet to stand on street corners, giving out poems and beautifully written flyers, also flyers they can hardly bear to look at because of the screaming rhetoric. <laughs> it is the responsibility of the poet to be lazy, to hang out and prophesy. It is the responsibility of the poet not to pay war taxes. It is the responsibility of the poet to go in and out of ivory towers and two-room apartments on Avenue C and buckwheat fields and army camps. It is the responsibility of the male poet to be a woman. It is the responsibility of the female poet to be a woman. It is the poet's responsibility to speak truth to power, as the Quakers say. It is the poet's responsibility to learn the truth from the powerless. It is the responsibility of the poet to say many times there is no freedom without justice, and this means economic justice and love justice. It is the responsibility of the poet to sing this in all the original and traditional tunes of singing and telling poems. It is the responsibility of the poet to listen to gossip and pass it on the way storytellers decant the story of life. There is no freedom without fear and bravery there is no freedom unless earth and air and water continue and children also continue. It is the responsibility of the poet to be a woman, to keep an eye on this world and cry out like Cassandra, but be listened to this time.